Yeah, welcome everyone for High Performance Computing Lecture 7, Hybrid Programming and Patterns. The second part of Lecture 7, think about mid, much more a broader picture. In the first part of the lecture, we thought about hybrid programming, which is perhaps by far the most complex aspect of HPC application design and programming that you have, combining MPI together with OpenMP, essentially distributed memory with shared memory, where you would employ some patterns of saying you can do shared memory within one node and having memory access there and then basically go distributed memory across the different nodes with MPI in order to, let's say, exchange data and work on different, let's say, data elements. But we have seen that it's quite incredible complex. You have different ways how to do it. You have a task mode, a vector mode. You have different levels of threat safety you have to consider. And all in all, this was already incredibly complex. So only do this if necessary. That was a takeaway message. Think about that MPI scales quite well, especially in the light of the fact that we have more and more CPUs available. The nodes and systems get in general much bigger and with this, it might be quite good to leverage this. On the other hand, of course, if you want to fine tune and you become an HPC expert, then it might be quite straightforward every now and then. If you have seen the HPDB scan from our way of doing this data mining algorithm in parallel, this was giving us added value. But of course, this would take time. You would have to do some um basically benchmarking you have to do some performance analysis things we will learn in lecture eight after this lecture that really helps you with certain tools to scale up that well and then use this different paradigms very well because then you also see some interesting behavior of your application you may not consider just by thinking about because essentially that's a key problem of this parallel programming using hybrid um, structures you have to think quite around the corner you have this different levels of parallelization and when you think about then on top that you want to combine it these days with popular accelerators gpus graphics um, which uh, basically graphical cards which come from nvidia but also soon from radeon and basically um, amd cards so we have a very wild jungle of parallelization going on right to be honest and this is something to carefully review if all the time spends in doing MPI, OpenMP and CUDA, or maybe different paradigms that we will learn in lecture nine, when we will go to the GPU area, then this is really something that also has to take into consideration if it's really worth the effort going that way. However, if you feel to be the experts, if you know all the tools, um, of course, you can really maybe carve out the most important performance or the most, let's say, uh, striking performance of your application. But it definitely is a very stone path to go. So the second part of the lecture here is more rather bigger picture. So we want to think about hybrid programming is if you want one way of a pattern. But here the patterns are saying essentially certain ways of how you would program now MPI and OpenMP in different application domains. Hence, it's tightly connected in a way to all the application areas we have at the later part within the course. But it also shows you already that some basics exist and some lessons learned can be done from, you know, over and over again, use MPI, maybe in stencil methods. We will learn that numerical methods are quite important in HPC to approximate reality. We have certain patterns which really stand the test of times, and this is part of the learning lecture, while then in the application domain-specific ones that we will learn by invited experts or by me, we will basically then re re come back to certain of these patterns, of course, and then go much more deeper how they're really used. So this should be just more rather a bigger picture of thinking, a little bit perhaps like the software engineering people do, right? You have this design patterns here, which was very famous from Erich Gamma. So when you develop software and software engineering, things that, you know, Matthias Bog is doing, that Helmut Neukirchen are doing, this is very valid. You have certain ways of a factory pattern. You have different ideas how you can again and again basically have the same problem solved with the so-called pattern design. You see these days, 
that even um, let's say integrated development environment like Eclipse have a specific support for these patterns. So, and 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 this is really useful. It gives you a really nice frame of reference, but um, it's also let's say very tuned to object oriented software, right? And when we think about our common patterns that we have here in the HPC, um, it is basically uh, a bit much more rarely elements in scientific computing. So basically these patterns would be not really used as design patterns of software engineering. Instead, people would have, let's say a, a few couple of patterns that I will reveal here that actually I use for solving some specific physics problems for um, thinking about so-called commonly used methods again and again in parallel codes, like maybe stencil methods, nearest neighbor communication, these are things that are always needed and in, of course in context of certain problems where you think about that when we want to go in parallel and large scale parallel we always have the problem that at some point in time your realistic domain is ending because your node has just not enough memory to do all of that you have to go across nodes and that means you have to think about that your domain for instance a terrestrial um, map maybe somewhere to do weather prediction you basically have to cut it down into different pieces, as you know. And this is something what design patterns in software engineering, for instance, don't really fully uh, basically address, right? So that we have a parallel way and a scalable way of distributed memory, and which in turn gets now complicated more that we have already learned with actually than another orthogonal way of actually having a so-called domain decomposition perhaps when you think about GPUs, because you want to, do, to leverage the device memory in the GPU as well. So in the sense, the common patterns in HPC are similar in the way of saying there are certain design patterns that are already again and again used in different domains in HPC all the time. Numerical methods based on known physical laws is a good example for this, stencil methods, nearest neighbor communication. But of course, it's not as formalized as you would say is this book here from Erich Gamma that I quote here, uh, uh, basically, which is very uh, kind of very famous book in, in software engineering, right? The key reason why that is a key is um, basically what most of the experts think it's in scientific computing and also in engineering, you have physics that rule the code. While in, in the typical software engineering, you would say reusability, readability of code. Um, your reusability of classes in object-oriented software um, before you instantiate objects. This is much more important. In, in scientific and engineering computing, what people think mostly firstly about is how I solve my physical algorithm, my physical law, my basically, you would really say it's about all equations, essentially, perhaps I want to solve over time. And we come to this when we think about partial differential equations. So it, in the end, it's a complete way of focus. Nevertheless, I have to say, and our research a little bit in some of the project we do together with software engineers is really to learn, so learn from the software engineering community because you see that essentially the usability, reusability, um, reproducibility of these codes are sometimes very limited in, in basically in physics codes that we have, the readability is quite limited. So I think there's a way of of basically stimulating both of these worlds to work together in order to come to an interesting approach. Here in Iceland, we do this a little bit in the currently running COE race, a center of excellence that actually combines AI with HPC. And there we really do the interaction room approach to really learn from software engineering how to better tackle in a less formal way, perhaps, than UML diagrams, which are very known in software engineering, but still in a very, let's say, useful way, how we can tackle, let's say, physical domain problems in context also of AI, of machine learning methods, things we will also learn in lecture 10 when we talk about parallel and scalable machine learning. So I think by now you have understood that patterns from software engineering are a little bit, let's say, different than we have in the parallel com com uh, computing world. 
And here's one example where you have certain patterns. You have seen this already when we thought about your assignment, when you think about the ocean simulation, wave propagation, but also if you want to think about a fish population moving, basically the neighborhood always plays a certain role. And here you would say that, of course, definitively this blocking and non-blocking communication here is a key issue. So here you have a certain pattern that you would say that this is, of course, something which we also learned here with the Cartesian communicator, right, where you have essentially this kind of grid, this Cartesian grid structure. This is definitely what you would see in several of the applications. So you would say it's a HPC application pattern to really think about nearest neighbors, to think about I have in one way a real world that you see illustrated here in a very coarse grained level uh, essentially here but that's what i want to simulate so why not chopping it down to different pieces making a cartesian grid around it and then basically just use a cartesian communicator that you already have learned what is essentially representing in one way or another one actually pattern that you have in parallel computing <clears throat> So when you think about the practice experience there, um, you would have, of course, the idea that this Cartesian communicator gives you this MPI virtual topology. It's not the direct physical topology of the hardware or the network. So that's something what you have to see. But still, it enables you in a very convenient way and nearest neighbor communication pattern in a very simple form. And you have seen this with the shifts in your assignments, what we have already learned in the MPI lectures in lecture four, how that is done with a shift, um, with the kind of periodic idea of maybe letting fish swim through the ocean all the time. So in a way, it's really a convenient way. Um, and it could be now, of course, different domains that you want to simulate. Nobody says that essentially now it's all about fishing our assignment uh, basically in the ocean and how much you can catch. It could be weather prediction, doing a very similar approach, right? And then, of course, questions will come, is Cartesian grid structures always the best? And, you know, maybe you can to do other domain decomposition that we will also allude to when we come to lecture 15 then in the Earth systems. But um, so you can, of course, think about that the granularity matters. But essentially, even if you increase the granularity or decrease it, it is still a communication pattern to have the nearest neighbor basically involved in your communication. And this is something which is proved really useful in many of these um, application sciences that we have. No matter it's a computational fluid dynamics code, it is just a general partial differential equation solver that you use. The Jacobi method we will now review a little bit. And, and some of these people will say um, to this kind of pattern, it's a stencil based way of doing things. So the stencil based way means essentially that you have um, a kind of really regular grid where you go over. And the interesting thing is that it has a typical iterative approach to it. And this has to do something with the numerical methods. That's why this lecture covers firstly now the stencil method, and then we go into the numerical methods. Why numerical methods are important, why numerical approximation needs to be done, because the complexity of applications is usually too large to really be solved. So we have to approximate. And the idea is to here think about that we have still a systematic way of doing it. And this is a stencil codes, right, going along the grid. But you also see immediately that when I want to calculate something for one particular element in this grid, my nearest neighbor are incredibly important. If I want to know what the wave height is, essentially in my tile of the ocean, I need to be informed what the wave height is, essentially around my neighbors, with a certain interesting side effect of saying, I want to know the height maybe in the time step before. And this time step is, again, the idea that I wanted to bring across in the second part of the lecture when we talk about iterative methods. Essentially, we want to do simulations over time. Computational fluid dynamics, crash tests, right, of a car. You're not interested in a static picture, maybe for here and there to think about some materials. But in the end, you are actually 
almost interested in a movie. You want to see the car crashing. And then you pick different materials. You basically form them in a different faction. Um, you basically have different ways of to influence your model. But in the end, you want to really compute how the basically crash really takes care um, of the different material reforming. You have different elements that we will also then review, of course, as part of the CFD lectures. But essentially, you have the situation that the neighbors are always very important to inform me. And this must not be 2D. It could be actually 3D, as you see here, right, in this plot on the right-hand side. And then when you think 3D, the question comes, is it only, let's say, my six neighbors here? So six in the terms of left, right neighbors, what you see here, and maybe what you then add is up and down, which is the six neighbors. But you can also think about the neighbors would be maybe the complete block, also including the diagonals. So, of course, this is something still forming a pattern. So the neighborhood is incredibly important. And this is uh, incredibly often leveraged in terms of computing partial differential equations over time. So the change over time of certain variables in physics code. Um, and I want to demonstrate this a little bit when we come to the Jacobi um, heat dissipation example, which is kind of a, let's say, hello grid or hello world example here in this area to really understand why we have essentially the stencils and why we need iterative methods here, simulation over time, and how it actually affects the nearest neighbors. So as the application example, I give you this Jacobi 2D application example. We have also a 3D example as a movie in the end of the lectures, where you quickly have two questions to think about. Um, firstly, this is a solver which means it basically gives you um, an iterative method example that essentially is nothing else, essentially of saying you have the arithmetic mean of a cell and it's, let's say, for neighbors of the cell, right? This is exactly what is demonstrated here. And um, there are different application examples for it. And one of them is solving the so-called diffusion equation, which means essentially you want to understand in a classroom, perhaps, that we don't see right now because of COVID, but in the end, you would see normally if you have a heat at some point in time, you have a ventilator, maybe another time, a window in another part, more complexity you can add. But if you, let's say, have a heating, it could be also ground heating somewhere in a pedestrian way here in Iceland, as it is often done, basically, you want to understand how much over time would the heat be actually expanding? And you can imagine this means that your neighborhood shows you a lot of different information about this. So, and this means for every time step, and it shows it then here, the initial time or initial heat map is essentially like this. Um, when you have a little bit the idea that this could be maybe somewhere in the ground and having a heat pipe um, essentially then want to um, be run over several different couples and shows you how essentially the pedestrian way above is then heated above, um, essentially from these different rounds over time. And of course, this means we need to have some physical laws coming to it and showing us how to do it. But it also means we need to be informed in the current time step, which we would call maybe actually T1, we want to be informed what happened at T0, what happened before, right? That's why you be, please carefully review this part. The arrows are pointing to the next time step. So when I talk about the neighbors, I'm generally, as a pattern here, not interested what they are right now, right? That's something, what is their domain? I have my domain in my grill in my grid here to, to think about, right? So what I'm generally, however, interested in is what was their values, what was their heat in the last time step because it significantly would influence my heat status right now in this time step, right? Again, so the heat of your neighbors in the last time step informs my current heat in this time step. 
And if you think about a fire, you immediately can imagine this. Of course, the pipe here in the ground would carry essentially the same essence. And this is exactly the idea of this iterative stencil method. So now over time, you will see how the heat dissipate, dissipation would work. Over time, you would see how this diffusion equation gives us some information, basically about the distribution of heat and so on. And it's exactly an idea um, how to basically compute this in a very systematic way. Um, of course, still think about that there are approximations partly when you think especially about diagonal values, because if you have this kind of rectangular grid in 2D or 3D, then of course your, your kind of third dimension is a little bit um, maybe blocky, right? People would refer today perhaps like Minecrafted. And also there you have to do some smoothing. Um, this brings us into the world also of finite elemental designs where you have adaptive mesh refinements. But essentially, this will come in later lectures. Here, I just want to give you the idea of the pattern in simulation sciences we don't really previously talked about. That if you do MPI send receives, if you do shared memory communication, often the pattern is that you get informed about the values of variables of physical problems from the time step before in order to compute your current time step in your domain right now. And of course, this depends on the domain decomposition. It depends on the algorithms. But essentially, that is a pattern that you see quite well here. So the shaded area that you see here is caches. And you can imagine doing this within the shared memory. This would be very fast. But we also know that shared memory is limited. So in the end, at some point in time, you're running out of memory. So you cannot just get essentially out of this, the shared memory value from the time step before that you maybe have access to. You have to do MPI. You have to do so-called halo regions. But in the end, let's stay away from the halo regions for a moment and think about that if you would have access to all the next, let's say, four neighboring and basically the old means here again uh, to put an emphasis here in this in this lecture that the time step zero informs the time step one and especially from my neighbors before because what I do then with this information depends on my own physical formula I will in compute in my domain like the neighbor has and the neighbor of him has and all the neighbors around have. Right. So they all do the same way, but they all have share the common problem. They need to have essentially an updated sweep of the situation before in my neighborhood. And if that is not in shared memory, I need to do distributed memory to get this information. And in other words, if you do it in shared memory, you have to think about that. We kind of have two two arrays, right? We would have the old situation and in order to write in T1, we need to have another array which has a time step of the current situation. And then you loop, you iterate, you iterate, iterate. And that's why we call it iterative over time stencil methods. I hope that concept gets more clear. It's really a certain pattern which is in many different physical um, application codes, exactly the modus operandi. You know it from your assignment. You're not supposed to have an ocean which stands still. You have an ocean over different time. You have a fish population that essentially says that the fish population around me is uh, informing perhaps the fish situation on my tile right now. So there are different examples where you can think about how that works. And it also motivates why now we talked about these patterns in a different style than maybe software engineers would do. Here we do this type of isotropic lattice technique. So we first think about the domain decomposition not about class reusage. We want to have a physical formula solved. And here we have the arithmetic mean, right? It looks perhaps a bit complicated, but don't worry about it. This has just a change over the time, let's say from time zero here, uh, time one here that we have is calculated by my four different neighbors with the different indices at the time step zero, right? And then there is this kind of different change over time diffusion equation that we can use to solve that. And this is, of course, something which requires in this kind of lattice 
uh, data structure, this isotropic um, grid and lattice that we have right now. And with this, we have the delta, essentially, which is the change. And this change, of course, over time means then essentially how the heat changes over time. So now you get the idea why I need the neighbors. For each of those neighbors is, of course, the same situation true. We highlight this only for one here. You can imagine that, of course, everyone is doing this. Well, we just painted this for one. Every tile has to do it. And then so in actually to compute the arithmetic mean in one time step to inform the next time step. So I think this, this is getting very clear now. So I think we can move on. Um, of course, here, um, it could be very quick if you do it in shared memory. Also think about that you can fully leverage the caches. Of course, there will be still um, cache misses, but still you have shared memory, which is still much more faster than always have to send and receive. So the next pattern we have to think about is what is happening if I don't have enough memory? Right. So if I need still my neighbors. So this is already what we alluded a little bit, if you remember, in the Mona Lisa, uh, also in the, let's say, Earth terrestrial setup in when we talked about earlier lecture about domain decomposition. Right. So now we have to have the same situation solved. And this means essentially we have to introduce this Harlow regions. Also those we have a little bit already tackled. We understand it's essentially nothing else than a value copy of the distributed memory I cannot access. But here is also the pattern that if you think about now what we talked about the Jacobi here in the 2D, that the time step now will be built from a physical formula that needs and requires data or values from the neighbors from the previous time step. And of course, if you do a shared memory within a node, that's possible. But as soon as you reach the, let's say, domain boundaries that is explored, uh, basically explained here a little bit, you come into this trouble of those neighbors that essentially are not any more existing, right? We just fake it here with the so-called halo. So with every time step, we have to fill the halo with the values so that essentially the real domain can still form its correct um, value based on the physical um, formula in, in the basically current time step by having access to the data of the previous time step. But this means already your MPI program needs to be aware of it. It needs to be sending these values in the time step before to be essentially used in the current time step now for computing a specific cell. And now in terms of hybrid programming, you would say you can actually now vary how big, how, how big this hello region really, or hollow or ghost region, as some people also call it, the ghost layers, um, how big that gonna be. Because if you leverage shared memory, there's a chance that you decrease the hollow regions. Right, um, because you have just much more at your disposal within the memory region. But um, still, um, this is something to consider, and is really a pattern that you see here in HPC in parallel computing for specifically now thinking about again iterative and stencil methods that you have to update the domains with the neighborhoods and so forth. So when you do this, you have to think about the domain decomposition. And by now, you know, we had this already in one of our lectures before. Here, the communication is actually different. So we would say in the end, it's all the same domain I want to simulate. But practice reveals actually that different communication exchanges. You see here, the communication exchanges required if you cut down this domain on the left side, are essentially 48. While on the right hand side, you have this kind of blocky way of doing it, if you want, you have just 32 in terms of communication overhead. So this explains you already how a smart domain composition can affect a lot of performance in your code. Because you also have to think about if you have now an iterative method, it may do this communication incredibly often to really, you know, get always, of course, the data of the boundary right which is a key problem, right? We're not talking about these grid sizes here in the middle of the domain. These are usually very well off. They get their information from the neighbors. 
but essentially we talk about these boundaries here where there are no neighbors. Here we have to do always this Harlow exchange. And with this, of course, there is some communication effect that could be um, essentially also affect then the performance of your application. And this is also something which you then see in performance analysis, right? When you want to understand where exactly are my processes running on the different machines, how, what is the communication pattern that is essentially running there? So these are all methods which we then will basically come back to in lecture eight. I also wanted to give you a little bit of a early example how that could now work in real world simulations also because it fits directly with your assignment with the ocean simulation it's still going on and of course you have to think about that now this nearest neighbor is in many different areas of science is very important and gives you some clue what essentially the situation is so however i think from learning and doing this now since 15 years in HPC and teaching, I think the terrestrial systems carry a lot of essence to really have a good illustration of how that could work. I mean, firstly, you have to think about that in a way we in HPC always want to have the best realistic behavior. We don't want to play games, right? We don't want to see it beautiful. That's why you also see sometimes that we have the stupid uh, blocky characters with concrete values instead of a very nice smoothening approach, which perhaps looks perfect, but is very unprecise. So in, in scientific computing, we are different than gaming. We want to have the real values exploited. And of course, when we think about realistic behavior, we much more think instead of smoothing, of increasing the granularity. Right. Of course, if you do this, let's say by by many factors of magnitudes, to, you come to a smoothing effect here that you see clearly uh, by reducing the kilometers here. Um, essentially, that we we gonna cut in all of the domain decomposition. We directly see from a very blocky uh, domain decomposition going down to a very let's say fine granular one. It's getting more smooth in a way, but still, you can imagine that then. The idea of the scientific application is again not doing just this nice increasing of you know granularities. We're also much more interested in adding maybe different physical laws. One example would be the weather is maybe influenced also with different aspects in the ocean, or we want to have a physical ship cross the ocean at a certain different weather condition. We want to have um, different physical laws at the same time. So we add more complexity over it, more parameters over it. And still every time step I need to exchange. So this is very clear still. So what you also know from your assignment, the ship is moving in one direction. The fishes are differently moving in different directions. They cannot touch land. So you have some sort of boundary conditions as well, where the question is, what would be the wave height? If you propagate a wave and it actually touches a boundary of a, let's say, real area with land. So, and you can go on and go on. If you want to do realistic, we won't be interested in rain. We want to be interested in a storm, maybe, or in an oil disaster or from an oil platform. So how this means and influences essentially our domain. When you think about fluid flow, liquid flow, waves, you see immediately that the complexity is kind of endless. You have boats, fishes, birds, people, oil platforms. You can come more to realistic behavior of how you simulate the whole world in this terrestrial systems. And you can imagine we don't have the computing power to do all of this. It would be nice. Then we perhaps would understand perfectly the Earth right now. But as you know from Greta and, and maybe other factors today, um, the Paris Agreement that we have, we have to do something and we have to better understand the world and think about our climate. And I think the best illustration you can see a little bit here for that is extremely this complexity, right? You would say that in the end, terrestrial systems are straightforward because they follow known physical laws. And, and this is clear, but the problem is there's so many different physical laws on different areas and basically they're all in interaction with each other right you see precipitation rainfall has something to do with the clouds with the clouds movement has something to do 
with the evaporation to form clouds. It has something to do with the atmosphere, with the transmission from essentially different elements that come from the Earth's surface. And you come to a point that all of this is incredibly complex. And by and, and if you want to really simulate this, you can essentially do this. You have the physics perhaps established in all of these different areas, but to get them interconnected is, is in nature too complex to do. It's by, governed by so many equations to compute that we still have not supercomputing power enough to do this. So that's why essentially this behavior where you say what we're interested in is usually so-called governed by difference equations, which means we are interested over the change over time, right? Um, we have this as an idea of a simulation that is running, you would say a typical day and the cloud movement here over certain terrestrial areas. And of course, I'm interested in maybe in the rainfall uh, when I want to do some excursion into the mountains, whatever it is, um, essentially we're interested in the change of state over time. Also, when we want to understand some physical um, or essentially also some world phenomena, when you think about some of the areas of flooding, which is happening every now and then, or areas where basically we want to understand how different ecosystems come together and influence the groundwater modeling. Um, and this is, let's say, different things which we can use um, about so-called system states, which usually evolve, of course, continuously in time, right? But here for the simulations is, um, is, is a kind of different question. So here we would have questions like, is there a state which does not change anymore? Do we reach a so-called equilibrium state? That is what we want to analyze, right? That this is what we're interested in, perhaps. Or do we maybe understand and identify a periodic state, basically the state that always returns over time to a certain aspect, then we can really explain things. We can understand the world phenomena. And basically by, by doing this and understanding this, we need to compute these different laws. We have these equations, we know the difference, um, but all of them, combining them, is too basically in, in the reality point of view much more tough to do especially also if you think about a pure mathematical model it is still too much to do it's too much equations that governing let's say all of these different areas so what we usually do is uh, we do so-called numerical approximations derived from simplified mythical models that actually are used to to approximate really solutions for these problems. And this has been working quite well in the past. You always have to think about, we cannot compute it completely, so we would have nothing if we would not have numerical approximation. And the errors in the weather forecast that you're maybe sometimes very annoyed about are exactly this, right? So numerical approximation is of course useful in one way of saying the next three days of weather are very good, but the trouble we run go to that numerical approximations have some instability, I would call it, inside, given the numerical situation. And with this, you basically would have, let's say, weather predicted over a week to be really unreliable, because essentially we will learn also in one later lecture 15, then when we review this more carefully, that of course, this has certain problems with it. However, it deals with the complexity. We have really a chance of simulating parts, at least, of the reality, which are typically too computationally expensive, or in other words, basically totally impossible to analytically compute, right? So, and, and with this, the numerical approximation, numerical laws based, of course, on known physical laws, these are the way to go. And there are different toolkits, which we could consider again now thinking about patterns, uh, which are relevant here, and PETC is one of it. Essentially, we're interested in many of the partial differential equations because they contain then basically this partial derivatives that also capture the, the basically the change over time, the change of state, whatever it is, what you simulate. 
And of course, it's now a little bit, let's say, abstract. That's the idea to really have it as an abstract pattern here that partial differential equations capture this idea um, and basically have the potential now to solve you in, in different areas of science, different problems, let it be sound, heat, electrostatics, fluid flow. The idea of the general principle of this PDEs is usually very um, similar. That's why they're so-called PDE solvers that you will find in HPC incredibly often. So we are usually also basically interested in this um, partial differential equations because we are interested in, in multivariable functions. So we don't have this single space of systems where single variables and the derivatives make just sense. Usually you know from the complexity that basically um, we have multi dimensions to solve here in a dynamical systems, and that's why ordinary differential equations um, that model typically one dimensional dynamical systems are perhaps less used than really the PDEs in the most or majority of applications here. So one example that we also will then review again in, in lecture 15 is then basically this power flow model where we again have this typical situation of a physics application that essentially says we want to interested want to be interested what the subsurface is in the groundwater modeling which is affected by the land surface interactions of water but also what is happening in the atmosphere right so you essentially have different different models that you need to combine here and different types of physics to combine in order to solve this problem. And we will come back to this in lecture 15. And also we'll learn then there that essentially the pattern that we just discussed with the 2D grid can be of course applied to a 3D grid because now we're interested in the, again, the blocky behavior. We can put these blocks on different processors, as you know, and create hollow regions between them as we know, when we want to have essentially the boundaries informed in the next time step of the simulation over this terrestrial domain, then basically we need to inform always one step ahead, so to speak, or one step before, if you want, um, what is this particular cell in terms of values? And the values can be quite cumbersome, could be quite a lot when you think about terrestrial systems, which we also will reveal in lecture 15. But it also reveals you that, of course, the domain is not always perfectly blocky. When you think about here and a, a kind of, let's say, a river going through the certain tiles, it really catches not a blocky uh, terrain. It basically has, let's say, an approximation of the, um, the way through different cells in it. And so maybe tree-based models may be actually much more sense to apply in these simulations. We will come back to the CLM model, to the different atmospheric COSMO and power flow models as well. When you think about what they have to solve, um, they have essentially uh, an interesting, yeah, established code to focus completely on CLM in the land surface model. Also there, of course, the liquid flow is important to inform about the groundwater modeling. So that's why essentially you see that this model should inform also then the subsurface. On, of course, on the other hand, it's also getting directly in contact with the atmosphere, and that's why it also is an interaction with the cosmo, with another, let's say, physical code that is really in direct interactions, uh, basically, with the land surface model, and indirectly, of course, also influence in the groundwater with power flow. So essentially, you see here a very good example of this complexity I was alluding to. What here is employs is the same things we already learned, hybrid programming, MP within a node, and then MPI routines across the nodes in order to have a larger geographical region to be covered, right? If you do everything in shared memory with OpenMP, we would have just a very, very small terrestrial system. So we need MPI, but of course it can be tuned by using OpenMP within a node. What we also see here and we'll then see in lecture 15 more in detail is as a certain pattern, you can couple modules, you can couple different physical codes to make it more realistic. So in this example, we will couple CLM, so the land and let's say the, the kind of 
land model and land surface model with the groundwater model to make a really tight interaction of physical parameters to catch the reality. And then you can even connect those again to Cosmo, right, which was then the atmosphere. So you see we more and more add reality to this. And this is an example to show you that, of course, in similar ways, we can also do this not only in terrestrial systems, but also in systems biology. Here we have a code called neuron nest code, which really actually is simulating the neurons that we have in the human brain and synapses. So really to a substantial degree of performance. And essentially, the interesting thing here is that the patterns that work here are very similar again right and we will review this in lecture 13 when we also see that essentially this is one of the key challenges in hpc today um, you see here the human scale that we can reach with supercomputers is just in the order of a couple of percentages of the what the humans really could do and of course that also means that a supercomputer is not like really human brain we still have a best supercomputer on our shoulders which is our brain from all humans it's energy efficient it's incredibly powerful to solve analytical problems and i think it's it's basically the key challenge perhaps or one of the key challenges really in the future to really understand our human brain also to tackle diseases right which is of course then once we understand it once we can simulate it we much better can treat we can better understand diseases like alzheimer's neurological diseases and there are lots of research projects already going on in this area, like in the Human Brain Project, that also is partly addressed here. This Nest code that's really scales quite well. Also, these days on the K computer, one of the largest computers we have, but these are some older plots. But this Nest is actually going on much more in development. Right, so that's really all I wanted to say today. Um, just having a short demo here on this Jacobi that it's also existing in 3D. I think by now you can see a heat dissipation in the room would be very strange if it would be just 2D. It needs to be 3D. And with there, you have, of course, a question how much you involve your neighbors, right, in the heat dissipation. Um, should it be blocky, let's say six neighbors? Should it be all neighbors, also including diagonals? All of these questions you have to do when you do modeling, when you do simulation design, and of course, then also have this included in your pattern of communication, right? And nearest neighbor communication and so forth. So that shows you also nicely how, you know, periodic works. You go across the domain and then start at the other end again uh, with the same structure and see over time how the heat here is now dissipating. Um, so I think that's all what you needed to know from this particular application. And with this, we are in the act of lecture seven today, just some bibliography, some references. And I think the next couple of lectures will be still conceptual. We will review in lecture eight performance analysis tools and a way of systematically understand the performance of programs um, with certain tools, but also then we'll look into the world of accelerators, which we touched upon today as well in Lecture 9, which is also coming up very soon.